My name's Ed Dollar. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this evening. Uh, I thought what I would do is, is certainly spend uh, five or so minutes giving you my opinion on, uh, on what will uh, potentially come after, come after DRAM. And I think uh, I'll kind of take a, a, a pretty different approach to, to the discussion. And let me, uh, let me start with where I think it's going. I think uh, from a Micron standpoint, uh, we clearly have visibility into the next three DRAM process generations. And so uh, in terms of imminent need for a technology in the next uh, year, two years, three years, uh, probably no need for it. Um, but, but clearly, there is a need uh, towards the middle of the decade uh, for a displacement technology. And so uh, what, what I want to do is kind of give you uh, my view of, of what that really means to the industry. And so if, if you believe what I just told you, that by the middle of the decade, by 2015 or so, you know, maybe it's 2016, 2014, 2017, but, but somewhere towards the middle of this decade, we're going to need something different, then I'd argue that we are in that window of lead time. And I think this is a very important thing for everybody to really pause and think about. And what I mean by that is where do you think guys like Intel today are designing platforms for? Is it for 2011, 2012? You know, those are long gone from a design standpoint. They are looking at platforms in the 2015, 2016, and 2017 timeframe right now. So what that fundamentally means is you better be in a position to be looking that far out in the horizon, looking at the alternative technologies that are available, and you better be in a reasonable position to base where you think the industry is going today if you're going to influence any of the ecosystem. I use Intel as an example, but you know, guys at Microsoft aren't sitting around uh, not thinking about this because I, I talk to them quite often about my opinions of where the technology is going. So if you believe that we're in the window of potentially influencing this computing architecture we talk about, then my belief is that you better start looking at what is fundamentally working right now. Uh, you know, when we uh, started working on phase change memory, it was about 2000. And so we're about 10 years later than that, and we're just in production on phase change memory in low volume. And so you better start looking at what technology is working now. You also better start looking at two other things that are pretty darn important, and that is scalability of the technology. You know, the last thing you want to do is walk in and get the entire computing world to start changing architecture, get out to 2015 and go, hey, just kidding, it's not really scalable. So you better have a technology that's scalable, and you better have something that's reasonable in terms of a system level solution. Now, I'd love to sit here and say, yes, uh, you know, we're going to create a non-volatile DRAM. That would be a beautiful thing. And clearly, as I'll show you on the next couple of slides, the industry is trying to do that. Uh, you know, but the industry is also trying to create cold fusion, and there's a lot of work to try to do what we're talking about here. So, uh, you know, if I look at those attributes, what I did was I said, well, let, let's take a look at a, a list of what I think are some of the options that are being talked about in the industry. There's ferroelectric RAM, there's MRAM, there's floating body RAM, there's TRAM, and there's PCM. And I'm not going to go through all the attributes. I don't want to sit here and bore you with the details. You guys can take a look at that. But what I really wanted to do is say, well, relative to each of these, how do I score them relative to what I just described on the prior slide? And so if I look at ferroelectric RAM, and I'm going to grade each of these on three aspects. Compatibility, is it in production today, or, and is it scalable? And so uh, you know, the, the ideal one up there would be one that's in production today, one that's scalable, and one that is compatible with DRAM. And I want to make one thing clear. When I talk about uh, DRAM, I use the term very tightly. I'm talking about a capacitive-based DRAM. And so to the extent any of these are compatible with DRAM, well, then you know, my job gets a whole lot easier. And so what, what we have to look at is the likelihood of any one of these being drop-in compatible with DRAM and the likelihood of fundamentally the technology working and being scalable. So if I look at ferroelectric RAM, I'd argue uh, not so compatible. Is it in production? Yeah, you know, obviously ferroelectrics have been around. They're being sold. Uh, is it scalable? I'd say, you know, I don't think so. And so I'd cross that one off. Uh, MRAM, no offense, but... <laughs> And, and by the way, notice the star there, and I think this is important. 
I think MRAM, it's a great technology. I, I have trouble fundamentally with the scalability of the current architected MRAM. There's, there's a tremendous amount of effort in the industry to look at ways to scale that technology to make the cell size compatible with DRAM, but I'd argue in, in the classic sense of me grading the scalability to the extent that, that that fundamental technology work has to happen over the next couple of years, I would say with the current technology that's in production, I'd say there's, there's some roadblocks to the scalability of the technology. So it's compatible. It's in production, uh, but scalability to keep it going, I think, requires a tremendous amount of engineering work. Um, the other two I put on here, uh, again, I, I assume some of you are familiar with these. I don't want to go into the technical details, but two very encouraging technologies. Uh, I get pretty excited when, uh, when, when I look at the potential capability of these technologies. Why? because it's nirvana, right? It, this is, uh, you know, anybody that's been in the memory industry has always looked towards non-volatile DRAM. I mean, if we can do that as an industry, uh, it, it's, it's a great day for all of us. Uh, it's compatible, it's potentially scalable, but it's not in production yet. And so in the grand scheme of this technology pipeline, it's, it's, it's back here. And so PCM, you know, as much as I love PCM, as much as I'd say we have PCM in production, as much as I could, I could debate anybody on the scalability of PCM, it's not compatible. You know, let, me, let me make that clear. PCM today is not drop-in compatible with a DRAM. You may be able to get it close on the read side, but you're not going to get it symmetrical on the right side. And so you know, I look at that list, and to my prior comment, I would say, if I had to pick one of those to at least start down the path of looking architecturally at what we need to do to intercept what I think is this middle of decade time frame, I obviously think PCM makes sense. But what that fundamentally means is we're going to have to look at the architecture of just about every computing system known to man and figure out what to do with PCM. And you know, th this is a chart that, uh, that was put together by a, another colleague of mine uh, at, at Micron. Uh, it clearly means that this whole memory hierarchy is going gonna, is gonna to move around quite a bit. And you, know, you could argue that if PCM makes its way into that stack, it's just a matter of how big PCM is relative to DRAM. And obviously, that's going to be directly related to the cost of the technologies. So to the extent that DRAM moves through from a cost standpoint, DRAM, in the middle of the decade or sooner, you're going to see computing architects picking up that memory technology. And uh, just like you're seeing a lot of gigabytes of NAND making its way into that computing platform, uh, my fundamental belief is you'll start to see bigger chunks of PCM moving into that platform. Uh, will not completely take DRAM out, but it will start to minimize the amount of DRAM required in the computing platform. So that's, uh, that's my view, and I'm sticking to it. 